every word from the perspective of the losing party. I ask myself how I would view the decision if one of my children was the party that I was ruling against. Even though I would not like the results, would I understand that the decision was fairly reasoned and grounded in law? Judge Amy Coney Barrett, mother of seven, referencing her parental experience while delivering her opening statement of her confirmation hearing, the contentious Supreme Court showdown. Democrats calling out Republicans for breaking their own precedent, charging ahead three weeks before Election Day. Judge Barrett's stance on abortion and the Affordable Care Act under intense scrutiny in the Senate. Every American must understand that with this nomination, equal justice under law is at stake. I think this hearing is a sham. Rather than reviewing your judicial philosophies, they're instead choosing to project their own desires and their fears onto the American people. Trump back out on the trail tonight, declaring himself COVID free and doubling down on the claim that he's immune. His doctor says he's no longer at risk of spreading the virus. Joe Biden calling out the president for quote, reckless behavior, divisive rhetoric and fear mongering. Plus that awkward moment when the White House chief of staff refused to talk to porters after being reminded of the mask policy. COVID surging in the U.S., more than 50,000 cases a day for four days in a row. And Dr. Anthony Fauci lashing out at the Trump campaign for using him in an ad, saying his words are being taken out of context and used without his permission. Delta's destruction, the hurricane slamming the South, dangerous flooding from Louisiana to Georgia. Ginger Z on where the system is now and what can be done to protect our country's coastline. The futuristic way for first responders to get quickly to the scene. The jet pack. Our Maggie Rooley takes one for a spin. And in the battleground state of Arizona, where the demographics are changing, meet the independent voters who are now taking sides and taking action. Better than sitting on the couch, watching the news, doing nothing. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming us from from your couch or otherwise. For the first time since becoming infected with COVID-19, President Trump back out on the campaign trail today. He is in Florida, certainly a critical state in this election. Back in Washington, the focus was on the confirmation hearings for his pick to replace Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. The dangers of the pandemic never too far away. His nominee, Judge Amy Coney Barrett, wearing a mask during most of the proceedings. Democrats, including Vice presidential nominee Senator Kamala Harris blasted the process with the election just 22 days away, claiming Barrett is a threat to the Affordable Care Act. As for what Amy Coney Barrett has to say, Terry Moran leads us off. The stage was set, a socially distanced hearing room, but Democrats in a surprise changed the script. For once remarkably united, one after another, the Democrats argued that this confirmation threatens all Americans' health care and the protections for pre-existing conditions. Stripping health care from millions of Americans during a pandemic, that's really what is at stake. On the other side, Republicans were brimming with confidence for good reason. They've got the votes. Committee Chairman Senator Lindsey Graham even acknowledging that no Supreme Court justice has ever been confirmed so close to Election Day. My Democratic colleagues will say this has never been done, and they're right in this regard. Nobody's, I think, has ever been confirmed in an election year past July. Graham also cited the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said presidents are elected for four years, not three, and so can nominate justices throughout their terms. But Senator Amy Klobuchar pointedly reminded Graham of Ginsburg's final wish that her seat would not be filled until a new president is installed. This isn't Donald Trump's country. It is yours. This shouldn't be Donald Trump's judge. It should be yours. Democratic vice presidential nominee Senator Kamala Harris appearing by remote link, also invoking Ginsburg with a dire warning about Judge Barrett. Replacing Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg with someone who will undo her legacy, President Trump is attempting to roll back Americans' rights for decades to come. But health care was the Democrats' main line of attack, and it got personal, sharing moving stories of constituents who depend on the Affordable Care Act, with the Supreme Court scheduled to take up that law just a week after the election. Democrats steered clear of any mention of Judge Barrett's Catholic faith in contrast to her 2017 confirmation hearings for the appeals court, but Republicans still accused them of using her faith against her. Political opponents want to paint you as is a 
TV or cartoon version of a religious radical. They're attacking you as a mom and a woman of faith because they cannot attack your qualifications. That is an attempt to bring back the days of the religious test. Barrett herself sat stoically for five hours wearing a mask, which she hadn't done in her Rose Garden nomination ceremony. And when she removed it to speak, she spoke of her mentor, the late Justice Antonin Scalia, whose judicial philosophy she shares. Judge must apply the law as it is written, not as she wishes it were. Sometimes that approach meant reaching results that he did not like. And on the key issues that could come before her, are not designed to solve every problem or right every wrong in our public life. Most of Barrett's children were seated behind her, the mother of seven from the South and Midwest, talking about her roots. If confirmed, she'd be the only justice not to have attended an Ivy League school. Be the only sitting justice who didn't attend school at Harvard or Yale, but I am confident that Notre Dame could hold its own, and maybe I could even teach them a thing or two about football. A little moment of levity there in an otherwise heavy day. For more context, we'll bring in Terry Moran now. And, and Terry, as we watched today's hearing, we couldn't forget the pandemic. I mean, Judge Barrett wore a mask except when she was speaking. And Senator Mike Lee, who tested positive for COVID after that Rose Garden ceremony, was seen without a mask. How much does COVID-19, uh, how, how much is it looming large in this whole process? Of course, Lindsay, it is hanging over this hearing. The Democrats actually wanted everyone who would be in that room, senators included, to get tested. Senator Graham, the chairman, declined. But Democrats were arguing that this nomination itself is associated with a coronavirus outbreak, first at the Rose Garden, then reaching here to the Senate, into the upper echelons of the Republican Party. Uh, they said best practices uh, is to test everyone. Senator Graham said the architect of the Capitol had measured the spaces here. They are CDC compliant, he said, and he went forward arguing, in contrast, uh, that millions of Americans have to go to work every day. The Senate Judiciary Committee should, too. And, and two late justices certainly still had a major impact today as well. Judge Barrett's mentor, Justice Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose death created this open seat. Scalia and Ginsburg were on opposite ideological ends, but were both confirmed by near unanimous votes. Have Supreme Court confirmations become more contentious in recent years, or has it always been that way? You know, it hasn't always been that way. Ruth Ginsburg herself was was confirmed with almost a unanimous vote in the Senate. Scalia had one vote against him. Things changed with the nomination of Robert Bork, but also a couple of other factors. Uh, the Republican Party for 50 years now has made it one of its main planks in its platforms to See, gain control of the Supreme Court to overturn Roe versus Wade and other progressive uh, precedents. And then on the other side, the court itself got very activist in many ways, striking down parts of the Voting Rights Act and, and, uh, and the Affordable Care Act is now under threat. And I think as a result, it's right in the middle of American politics. American politics is very divided right now. We're fighting over a lot of things, fighting over the court too. Terry Moran, thank you. And for more now on the Amy Coney Barrett confirmation hearings, we bring in ABC's Devin Dwyer, who covers the Supreme Court for us. Thanks so much for joining us, Devin. Today, Senate Democrats put health care at the center of this fight. The big secretive influences behind this unseemly rush see this nominee as a judicial torpedo they are firing at the ACA. This well could mean that if Judge Barrett is confirmed, Americans stand to lose the benefits that the ACA provides. So I hope you will clarify that in this hearing. So Devin, if Judge Barrett is seated, one of her first major cases would be over Obamacare. What do we know about where she stands on the Affordable Care Act and what her confirmation mean that pretty much with all certainty that there would be enough votes to overturn it? Well, Barrett has not weighed in on the Affordable Care Act as a judge, but Lindsay, as a law professor at Notre Dame, she has been unambiguous about her opposition. Uh, she criticized Chief Justice John Roberts in, uh, for his 2012 uh, decision upholding the individual mandate of Obamacare as a tax. Here's what she wrote. Take a look. She said, Chief Justice Roberts pushed the Affordable Care Act beyond its plausible meaning to save the statute 
He construed the penalty imposed on those without insurance as a tax. Had he treated the payment as the statute did, as a penalty, he would have had to invalidate the law. The same issue is now back before the Supreme Court. It would appear that Barrett is a pretty solid vote against all of that. But here's one key question that everybody should keep in mind. It's whether the individual mandate can be severed from the law. All of the justices are gonna to have to look at that. Can you simply strike down that part of it and keep the protections for people with pre-existing conditions? Barrett has never weighed in publicly on that, Lindsay. So the bottom line, we just don't know right now how the law will fare. And abortion is, of course, another huge focus of her confirmation as Barrett has been the most outspoken of any recent nominee on the issue. Clearly, she opposes abortion on personal and religious grounds, but what about precedent? I mean, is Roe v. Wade truly in danger? Yeah, she, she opposes abortion as a matter of conscience. In fact, she's written that it's, quote, always immoral in every case. As a judge, she has supported state efforts to restrict abortion access, but there is this question of Roe itself. Could she essentially move to overturn the law entirely? Well, there's one clue that abortion rights groups are pointing to. It's this, something she wrote in 2013 in the Texas Law Review. She said a justice's duty is to the Constitution, and it is legitimate for her to enforce her best under understanding of the Constitution rather than a precedent she thinks is clearly in conflict with it. So perhaps a sign there that she sees some room uh, to revisit Roe, but just a couple years ago, Lindsay, she gave a speech in Jacksonville, Florida. She said she thought Roe, uh, the core holding of Roe, would stand for some time, but that certainly states can move to enact restrictions to abortion in the years ahead. Lindsay. Devin Dwyer, thank you so much for your analysis. We appreciate it. And back to the race for the White House now. Three weeks. And to offer more insights about Judge Amy Coney Barrett, we bring in Nicole Garnett, a law professor at University of Notre Dame, who's been a friend and colleague of Judge Barrett's for more than 20 years. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor. Thank you for having me. So you first met Judge Barrett in 1998 when you were beginning your clerkship with Justice Clarence Thomas and she with Justice Antonin Scalia. Does it surprise you now that she is now a Supreme Court nominee? Well, I mean, I suppose if you look back to 1998, it would have been quite a surprise to both of us. Um, but there are many of the characteristics and qualities that I saw in her as a 27-year-old law clerk, I think, are the reasons and qualifications and characteristics that will make her an amazing justice. She's got a great legal mind. She's a person of great character. She's a person of humility. She's kind to everyone. She's compassionate. She impresses everybody. She works harder than everybody else. So I think, um, no, of course, it was would have been a... a Quite a surprise to us um, that uh, she might have been nominated to the Supreme Court. In fact, I remember walking down the steps of the court. I can't remember if it was with her, but I remember walking down the steps of the court and later having a conversation with her about how that last day when you leave the court, you think, wow, that's about the coolest thing that's ever going to happen to me. <laughs> um, so now to see my friend uh, testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee to walk back up those steps. Uh, 21 years later is really, uh, really something, and it's really gratifying because she's so amazing. And a super cool thing that's happening now as well. So you and many others speak about Judge Barrett's kindness, generosity, and relatability. She could also become the first mother of school-aged children on the Supreme Court. But since Judge Barrett vows to apply laws as they're written and defer to lawmakers, how much do you think that her personal qualities will really impact her rulings if her goal is to follow the intentions of policymakers and, in some cases, the founding fathers? Others. Well, well, of course, we all bring to our jobs um, many, many things that make us the people who we are. And the people who we are, um, that helps us to carry out the duties that have been given to us. And so I do think her, char her character and her integrity, um, the fact that she is a kind and generous person and a loving mom will make her the kind of person who will become Justice Barrett. But she's made quite clear, of course, that her uh, fidelity is first, foremost, and only to the rule of law, and that she'll follow the text as written as her mentor, Justice Scalia, taught her to. And, and Judge Barrett said today that a Supreme Court seat was not a position that she actively sought out and that she had to think carefully before accepting the nomination. Do you think that this was a difficult choice for her? And, and what may have held her back? Well, I think, you know, she's a mom of seven kids. Um, we live in a wonderful place full of some, uh, a supportive community, um, and we help each other. Uh, I know that if if uh, she leaves, I'm going to really miss her. 
And I suspect that if they leave, they'll miss us too. I think so, of course, thinking about your family as a working mother, and I'm a working mother of four kids, um, really is always first and foremost when you're making decisions. What, how, what will this mean to my family? So I'm sure that it did weigh on her. Um, she's perfectly pleased. She was great. She was very happy as a law professor. She didn't need to or seek out the Seventh Circuit, and she certainly didn't seek this out. I think she said yes. Uh, because both because she and her husband have decided this is something that they can do together as a couple and also because she feels like she's called to uh, to answer the you know to serve in the court this is her duty and her obligation is something that she is meant to be and meant to do so i think all of those things were in the mix when she was thinking about it and i'm sure she did give it careful thought as far as you know, does it give her any pause at all that her confirmation process comes just weeks before the election when millions of americans have already voted so I haven't spoken to Judge Barrett about that particular issue. I will say it's not at all unusual for a president to nominate someone to fill a vacant Supreme Court seat in the last year of a presidential term. In fact, it's happened 29 times in history. And 19 of those times, the president and the Senate were of the same party, and the Senate confirmed in those 19 times all but two of the justices. So it's important to remember the president's the president. He's the president until the middle of January. Um, the Constitution gives him the power to fill this vacancy, just as it gives the Senate the power of advice and consent. So the president has fulfilled his, he's, he's exercised his power, and now it's the Senate's turn to decide how to exercise theirs. And, and lastly, if confirmed, Judge Barrett would, of course, take the seat of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Should we assume that Judge Barrett's approach and her rulings would be the opposite of RBG's, or is there any aspect of Justice Ginsburg's legacy that Judge Barrett might try to continue? Well, I think as um, as she said today in her opening statement to the Senate, um, we are, she is, and as am I, indebted to Justice Ginsburg, who we, we was a justice while we were clerking. Um, she was a pathbreaker in the law for women, and we're grateful to her. Um, I don't think we should assume anything other than what she's told us about how she will rule as a justice. And she's said that her, her jurisprudential philosophy is that of Justice Scalia's, which is that she will apply the law as written. She sees that the judge, a judge is not a policymaker, and that sometimes applying the law as written takes you to places that you might not otherwise like. I'm sure that happened with Justice Ginsburg as well. Um, and I also think that I think Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg are really big buddies. Um, so I think we should really be careful before we make too many assumptions about people based on the party that not the party of the president who nominated them. Fair enough. Our thanks to you for your time and your insight, Professor Garnett. We appreciate it. Sure. Thank you very much. Have a nice night. You too. Back now to the race for the White House. Three weeks and one day until November 3rd. Both sides agree on one thing, that this is the most consequential election in recent history. Let's take another live look at the president's rally in Florida, his first on the campaign trail since spending the past week recovering from the coronavirus. The White House doctor now says that the president has tested negative. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is picking up the pace of his campaign, holding two events in the battleground state of Ohio today and blasting the president's management of the pandemic. ABC He's Mary Bruce has the latest. President Trump today heading to his first campaign rally since being diagnosed with the coronavirus, leaving the White House defiant with no mask. Waiting for him in the key state of Florida, throngs of tightly packed supporters with few masks in sight. Just one week after coming home from the hospital, the president claims he's virus free. And I've been tested totally negative. Tonight, his doctor said he has tested negative on consecutive days using rapid testing, concluding he is not infectious to others. The president going further, even claiming he's immune. It looks like I'm immune for, I don't know, maybe a long time or maybe... A short time, it could be a lifetime, nobody really knows, but I'm immune. But experts say immunity is not well understood, and doctors don't know how long it lasts. Twitter slapping a warning on Trump's claim that he can no longer get or give the virus, labeling his message misleading and potentially harmful. With 22 days to go, more than 9 million Americans have already voted, as our latest poll shows the president's handling of this pandemic is taking a toll. 
Joe Biden leading by 12 points nationally with a 23-point advantage among women voters and with a slight edge among seniors, a group key to Trump's victory in 2016, one that he's counting on for his re-election. Well aware of the numbers, the president ratcheting up his campaigning with an in-person event every day this week. Biden looking to capitalize on his momentum, campaigning today in Ohio, a state Trump won by eight points in 2016. But now polls show Biden and Trump neck and neck. Today in Toledo, Biden and calling out the president, saying his behavior is irresponsible. His reckless personal conduct since his diagnosis has been unconscionable. The longer Donald Trump is president, the more reckless he seems to get. Trying to change the narrative, the Trump campaign out with a new misleading ad that shows Dr. Anthony Fauci praising the administration's response. I can't imagine that anybody could be doing more. But that comment from the early days of the pandemic in March was about the broader response of the task force. Fauci today said his words were being twisted, and he warned the Trump campaign not to do it again. That might actually come back to backfire on them. I, I hope they don't do that, because that would be kind of playing a game that we don't want to play. While on Capitol Hill today, an uncomfortable moment. The president's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, who was by Trump's side in the hospital, taking off his mask to talk to reporters. When he was asked to keep the mask on, he refused and walked away. Some in the White House still defiant about not wearing a mask. Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, the president is holding that rally in Florida tonight with little changed on safety precautions. So what do we know about his travel plans going forward after being off the trail now for a week? Well, now with just three weeks to go and the president down in the polls, he is going to be out there going full steam ahead. Campaign sources tell us that the president is going to be on the trail every single day between now and Election Day and that he's going to start doing multiple rallies a day. You can see just from this event down in Florida that they are not making any changes to their safety precautions. They say they're following guidelines. Uh, they say, you know, they hand out masks. Most, they say, obviously don't choose to wear them. And the you know, White House sources tell us, look, it, this is America. They say in this country, everyone has a right to, to show up and express their point of view. And the Biden campaign, meanwhile, they're hitting the ground more often now. Where is his campaign focusing its energy in the days ahead? Joe Biden is spending a lot of time in states that Trump carried in 2016. He also is going to be down in Florida. He was in Ohio today and later in the week he will be in the key state of Pennsylvania, of course, answering questions at our ABC News Town Hall. Mary Bruce, our thanks to you. Thank you. An alarming number of COVID cases now on the rise in more than half the country tonight with hospitalizations increasing in 35 states. Meanwhile, a new study finds the virus can survive on certain services longer than initially thought. Our Eva Pilgrim has more on the coronavirus crisis. Tonight, the number of COVID cases and hospitalizations are on the rise in more than half the country. 14 states hitting a record number of hospitalizations last week. In Utah, one of the hot spots, entire families coming in. Many times, um, one of them makes it and one of them doesn't, and that's been really heartbreaking to see. Experts warning of an increase in the number of deaths in the coming days. When you look at what's going on in the United States, it's really very troublesome. More than 215,000 Americans have now died from the virus, including Julie Davis, a third grade teacher in North Carolina. She could reach every child in her classroom. And she just loved every child. Her family thinks she got the virus from a student at her school. Her school district has now moved to all remote learning. In New York, anger over COVID cluster shutdowns in parts of the city spilling into the streets. In Nashville, thousands crowded together and mostly maskless for this church service Sunday. This video posted on Twitter. Leader Sean Foyt tweeting with this video, the church will not be silenced. All this as a new study suggests that COVID may be able to survive on surfaces for up to 28 days. The virus able to stay on non-porous surfaces like glass, stainless steel, vinyl, and paper, but the actual amount of virus found was quite small and it'd be unlikely to cause infection. Still, a good reminder to wash your hands frequently. And tonight we're learning more about that first U.S. reinfection case from back in August. It was a healthy 25-year-old man with no underlying immune disorders. And researchers say this case shows that it is possible to have reinfection, reminding people just how important it is to continue to take those precautions, even if you've recovered. Lindsay.
Eva, thank you. And turning now to the political violence in our streets as opposing rallies turned deadly in Denver over the weekend. This dramatic image captures the moment right before the gunshot. Police say that the man on the left used pepper spray on the man on the right, who then appears to draw a firearm and then fatally shoots the man spraying him. The suspect identified as a security guard hired to protect a local news crew. ABC's Clayton Sandell has more. Tonight, new questions about a security guard hired by a local TV station now under investigation for first-degree murder. After a deadly shooting following protests that had been mostly peaceful. It happened as groups from the far right and far left had gathered for competing rallies Saturday in downtown Denver. Lee Keltner in the camouflage hat is seen arguing with a man before moving out of frame. Denver Post photojournalist Helen Richardson capturing the moment Keltner and another man, 30-year-old Matthew Doloff, get physical. It escalates immediately. Keltner appears to slap Doloff, who draws a gun, Keltner unleashing a cloud of pepper spray. Then that single shot. Keltner is fatally wounded. I don't know why he went from one argument to another. This all happened in two seconds. I didn't go to this event ever in my life expecting this to happen. It's just sad that someone lost their life over this. Police rush in seconds later, taking Doloff into custody. TV station KUSA says Doloff was working for them, but the city of Denver says he was not properly registered as a security guard. KUSA says Doloff was hired through the Pinkerton agency, but Pinkerton says Doloff was not an employee and worked for an outside vendor. The company says it's fully cooperating with the investigation, and we take loss of life in any situation very seriously. And Lindsay, Doloff is being held on investigation of first-degree murder. He has not entered a plea, but officials also tell us that if he was operating as a security guard without a license, he could face fines and even jail time. And one more thing, there's been a lot of online speculation that Doloff was a member of Antifa or some other radical left-wing organization. Denver police have now twice shot that down, saying it is not true. Lindsay? Clayton, thank you. When we come back, the terrifying surveillance video, armed intruders storming inside an Indiana home and a five-year-old who tries to defend his family. Our weather team is continuing to keep track of the remnants of Hurricane Delta on the east and where it could be a rainmaker. But up next in this polarized environment, what will it take to get the independent vote? Our journey to Arizona, where we take the temperature of voters. Stay with us. stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. With so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. Thank you to the doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals. To everyone keeping our supermarkets, pharmacies, gas stations running. To all the essential workers, we thank you. And with every question you have, we will be here for you every day. Because we will get through this together.
We are back now with Ballot Watch, and tonight we're taking a look at two key battleground states where early voting is already underway. In-person early voting began in Georgia this morning, and with it, huge lines in the Atlanta area. Some voters reporting waits of more than five hours to cast their ballots. There were some reports of technical issues, but mostly the large lines were simply due to a record turnout. About 120,000 people voted today. Luckily, so far, no repeat of the issues seen during Georgia's primary in June when a consolidation of polling places Places and a shortage of poll workers cause massive problems. Election officials have said that they are ready this time around. Early voting in Georgia runs through October 30th. Meanwhile, early voting started last week in Arizona, and Maricopa County, the state's largest, could hold the key if Joe Biden is to become only the second Democrat to win here since Harry Truman. And if early voting is any indication, enthusiasm is high. This is a packed parking lot there today. Maricopa broke the state's record last week for the highest number of in-person votes on the first day of early voting. And one of the biggest factors in whether Arizona swings from red to blue in 2020 will be independent voters. So ABC's Alex Perche spent some time in Arizona with that crucial voting block as they make their decision between President Trump and former Vice President Biden. I'll put your chair down. Even though the temperature still registers in the triple digits, every afternoon between 4 and 6, Linda and Tom Rawls walk to the edge of their dirt driveway in Carefree, Arizona and hold up their Joe Biden signs. Did we see you yesterday? Yeah. We're out here every day, four hours a day. They get honks, thumbs ups, the occasional middle finger, and they wave back at them all. It's our therapy. It's better than sitting on the couch, watching the news, doing nothing. Mm -hmm. We feel like we're contributing. Lifelong Republicans until 2016, the Rawls weren't fans of Donald Trump, so they voted for Gary Johnson. But this November, they'll proudly vote Democrat. Is there anything in particular that, that, that puts you over the edge? So we were sort of already there, but certainly Charlottesville is the time when I said enough. Because right now in the Republican Party, if you're not a fan in the cult of Donald Trump, you're not welcome, and they will, they will tell you that. You don't feel welcome? Oh, no, 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 no. As a matter of fact, when we sit out there with our signs, one of the things um, we hear the most often is go home. And we're trying to figure out, since we're at the end of our own driveway, where home is supposed to be. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we are home. And uh, this is a purple state. There are a lot of different opinions in this state. We're very independent-minded. Arizona State Public Affairs Professor Dr. Tom Riley says independents have turned this formerly bright red state purple and could help push it blue this time around. As a third of the state's electorate, independents are trending towards Biden by a whopping 25 points in the latest New York Times Siena poll, 53 to 28. What we're seeing is, is general frustration to the divisiveness that is occurring in Washington and across the United States, and people are searching for a different way. But they don't want a third party. Many of these individuals do not like the two-party system, uh, and they don't want to be pegged as having a certain platform. That's especially true among Latino voters. Born and raised in the Dominican Republic, Carolyn Van Oosten came to the U.S. during her college years. She voted for Obama in 08 and has ping-ponged between parties ever since. Her feelings towards Democrats? They're just taking it for granted and thinking, oh, okay, well, they're Latinos and they're going to go ahead and lean Democrat. That's not the case. She plans to vote for Biden, despite being disappointed in a lack of focus on the issues. A lot of the Democratic Party has been neglecting to really address that issue of immigration. And that's why we see that a lot of the Latino voters are really just going... Um, they're, they're really up for grabs, and they are having a hard time making a decision of which way to go because no one is addressing the issues that matter to them most. Maricopa County, which includes Phoenix, has by far the largest voting population in the state, and the county went for Trump by three points in 2016. He follows through on what he says. Barbie Ruin also voted for Gary Johnson in 2016, but now likes what she's seen from President Trump. What sold you on the president for another four years? What really, really sold me on it is since coronavirus has come out, our economy has stayed fairly stable. And that to me is, is astonishing, especially considering the number of people who are out of jobs because they can't go in. He's allowing the states to make the decisions for themselves, which is what it should be. The president's handling of the coronavirus was the deciding factor for Phil Berry as well. 
There's no question the handling of the coronavirus was a complete cluster. I think that would be a great way to just accept blame, which he has a problem doing, accept blame and say, look, I was wrong, let's get on, let's wear a mask, let's be healthy as a country, let's stop the carnage. The 52-year-old father of three is a registered Republican, though he's voted Democrat in four of the last five elections. Is Biden the ideal candidate for you? Biden is a very good candidate against a very bad candidate. Now, am I enamored with Joe? No, but I love his history. I love his resume politically. It seems like that the independent voter, it's, it's more of a mindset. It is, and there is no platform, there's no common doctrine, uh, there's no political playbook or pamphlet that they can go to to look at on how to vote. The one thing we found all the voters we talked to here want to turn down the temperature a little bit. I pray to get back to a country where we can have conversations where we don't agree on every issue and we can still be friends. And I know that sounds rather cliche, but that's really my deepest prayer. For ABC News Live, I'm Alex Perche, Carefree, Arizona. <laughs> Our thanks to Alex and still ahead here on Prime. It's a bird, it's a plane. Nope, that is a first responder training on jetpacks. Yes, you heard that correctly. The 11 year old facing charges after police say he stole a school bus. And LeBron James is a champion again, and the debate is growing louder. Who is the greatest of all time, LeBron or Michael Jordan? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day paying tribute to Roberta McCain, the mother of late Senator John McCain. Roberta passed away today. She was 108 years young. In times like these, the newsmaking events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face to face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong Un. The president. You trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. For me to be a part of such a historical franchise is uh, it's an unbelievable feeling, not only for myself, but for my teammates, for the organization, for the coaches, for the trainers, everybody that's here. Um, we just want our respect. Rob wants his respect. <laughs> Coach Vogel wanted his respect. Our organization want their respect. Laker Nation want their respect. And I want my damn respect, too. We heard that loud and clear. That was LeBron James last night during the postgame celebration after the Los Angeles Lakers clinched the 2020 NBA championship four games to two over the Miami Heat. Let's take a look at the Lakers' title win and what it means for LeBron's legacy by the numbers. It was NBA championship number 17 for the Lakers franchise, dating back to their days in Minneapolis and their 12th in Los Angeles. And it was the Lakers' first title in 10 years when Kobe Bryant led them to a championship in 2010. Bryant's death this year serving as a major motivation throughout the Lakers' latest championship run. For LeBron James, last night's win marks four championships with three different teams, one of only four players ever with that feat after his previous titles with the Miami Heat and Cleveland Cavaliers. He's also the first player in NBA history to win finals MVP four times with three franchises and at 35 is the second oldest player to win the award. And he now only trails Michael Jordan, who won finals MVP six times in his six championship runs. While some argue that the GOAT argument on the NBA's greatest of all time has long been settled in Jordan's favor, last night marked the 260th playoff game of LeBron's career, setting a new NBA record and his four rings in 17 seasons now gives him more than any other active NBA player. And with that demand for respect he made last night, he's made it clear that he believes he's still got a shot at more. And 
We still have a lot to get to here on Prime. Why those Black Friday deals we usually expect in November may actually start as early as tomorrow. And countering bias in healthcare, our examination of the subtle ways that treatment can be influenced. And after years of pushing back against this criticism, Facebook is now backing down and removing something from its platform that has enraged many for years. We'll explain. But first, here's a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth weekend of protest. Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. chair of the Judiciary Committee opening day one of the Supreme Court confirmation hearing, acknowledging what Democrats have feared. This is the beginning of a confirmation, not a consideration. This is probably not about persuading each other unless something really dramatic happens. All Republicans will vote yes and all Democrats will vote no. Yet still, Senate Democrats seizing the spotlight, focusing on what they say is at stake if Judge Amy Coney Barrett makes it onto the U.S. Supreme Court. Voting rights are at stake. The right to a safe and legal abortion is at stake. Republicans firing back, arguing judges should not make policy, but rather make decisions only based on law. You stand accused of intending to violate your oath before you even take it. Justice Scalia taught me more than just law. He was devoted to his family, resolute in his beliefs, and fearless of criticism. And as I embarked on my own legal career, I resolved to maintain that same perspective. President Trump's personal physician, Dr. Sean Conley, writes that the president has tested negative for COVID-19 on consecutive days over the weekend. Doctors cleared the president to attend in-person campaign rallies. President Trump holding a rally in the critical battleground state of Florida as he looks to distance himself from a pandemic still raging in parts of the country, cases increasing in at least 32 states and the District of Columbia. The World Health Organization says the highest rise in COVID cases worldwide has been reported in the last four days. Never in the history of public health has herd immunity been used as a strategy for responding to an outbreak. Spain declaring a state of emergency for its capital Madrid. Italy making masks mandatory even outdoors. And Britain braced for a new COVID alert system that will put the north of England in the midst of an outbreak under a strict new lockdown. Young boy in South Bend, Indiana, defends his home from suspected burglars. Police released dramatic surveillance video of the home invasion. It showed armed men entering the home while the family is there. Then the little boy starts throwing objects at one of the suspects. The men fled and are still in the loose, but no one inside the home was hurt. A chaotic scene in Baton Rouge caught on camera. Dozens of police cars in pursuit of a stolen school bus. The chase lasting 13 miles. I don't know what's going on, but it looked like somebody was stolen the school bus. Behind the wheel, an 11-year-old little boy. 
Police say the young suspect allegedly intentionally tried to hit another driver in his path. The high-speed pandemonium coming to an end when the bus slammed into a massive tree in the front yard of this couple's home. The minute after that, they knocked the boy out of the back of the truck. You can see the young boy surrounded by four officers arrested on four charges, including aggravated assault. Facebook is stepping up its efforts to crack down on conspiracy theories and misinformation before the election by banning posts that deny or distort the Holocaust. Facebook says that it will send people to legitimate sources if they search for information about the genocide. The summer Holocaust survivors around the world took part in the campaign. It urged Facebook to remove Holocaust denial posts from the site. Welcome back. The remnants of what was Hurricane Delta still affecting many parts of the east tonight after making landfall Friday night in Louisiana as a powerful Category 2 storm. The heavy winds and rain lashing the Gulf Coast yet again. Overhead drones shots of the Lake Charles area show extensive flooding. Homes surrounded by water, some roofs pulled right out of their frames. And while so many are trying to clean up, more than 180,000 customers are still without power. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z has the latest. Hey, Ginger. Hey, Lindsay, when you were showing that video, you have the roofs that were ripped. That was from Laura. That water was from Delta. And that's because Lake Charles was among the communities hit by both. The map that I want to show you right now shows how close those two tracks were, 12 miles apart. All of those highlighted areas in red were hit by both hurricanes, Lake Arthur, Jennings, so many others in southwestern Louisiana. But now the remnants have moved up to the northeast. We've already seen coastal flooding and, emerge and erosion from what is left of those remnants. And you can see it there spinning on the radar. The winds gusting to about 20 or 30, so nothing like it was. But what's going to happen here is you see the cold front approaching from the west. It's going to come together with the remnants and the tropical moisture, and it's going to squeeze out one to three inches anywhere from New York and Connecticut up through Massachusetts. See Boston there tomorrow night. New Hampshire and Maine, they could see two plus inches fall very quickly. Lindsay. And Ginger, we had the Republican Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana on the show on Friday who talked about the need to curb climate change in order to give people in the Gulf region some much needed relief from these storms. Remind us about some of the ways you've reported for us and it's not too late that can help especially those in low lying areas. Yeah, it's pretty outstanding. And a lot of people in Louisiana, when I was doing that story, told me it was game changing what the governor already was doing. And now to hear that he's done this sounds like the same type of thing. And they're already funding and looking for natural ways to rehabilitate the coastline. One of the projects, the Mississippi River Delta, is trying to take what we took away centuries ago, which was just oyster beds that acted as kind of speed bumps, natural speed bumps, so that storm surge would not impact the mouth of the Mississippi quite as much. We're starting to put those back in. We're starting to also build in and, and think about how we build in the future. And those are the types of mitigation factors that we can do right now that everyone along the Gulf Coast agrees with. Lindsay. So helpful to know. Okay, Ginger Z, thanks so much. And turning now to racial bias in medicine, instances of delays in care, misconceptions in pain tolerance, and not being believed by some medical professionals. So tonight, we have an inside look at one hospital organization that's making big changes when it comes to treating patients of color. Our Janae Norman has more on this new initiative. You may feel some discomfort today, and so I encourage you to be curious about that um, discomfort and perhaps lean into that. They're called um, Chats for Change, so, frank uh, yeah, and frankly uncomfortable yeah, conversations about racial bias in medicine. When you ask doctors, they'll say, I treat all my patients the same. I don't really understand why there are health care disparities. It's because you don't. I am seen as someone who has more authority or who has more training than I actually do. Racial bias is at play every day. They're part of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai's Racial Bias Initiative, a first of its kind program launched in 2015 with a lofty mission statement to provide healthcare and education that's free of racism and bias. Free of racism and bias. That's a huge undertaking. How do you think that you go about that? Because that's obviously, it, it's not an end goal as much as a continuation, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. We had to set a goal that was so aspirational um, that it would be clear to everyone around us it was a never-ending endeavor. 
its people and its the actual structure of the medical school? What are the ways in which that we set up conditions that either knowingly or unknowingly uh, perpetuate racism? We can't afford to not address it and head on. Racial bias is pervasive in the way it impacts the care of people of color in devastating and potentially fatal ways. One study showed black and brown Americans wait longer for care in the ER than white people. According to the CDC, black babies have a higher rate of dying in their first year of life compared to white babies. Another study finding black Americans are undertreated for pain compared to white Americans. Traumatizing. I mean, how do you trust a system that is ready to see you home because for whatever reason um, they don't want to hear you. In 2017, Camilla Mitchell says she was in the emergency room for eight hours, even given a breathalyzer test before getting treatment for uterine cancer. She's now consulting with Dr. Joy Cooper, whose clinic in Oakland, California, connects black women with black doctors. I always tell people that um, the healthcare system was not designed for black women in mind. J. Marion Sims, who's considered one of the fathers of gynecology, actually performed surgeries on slaves with their master's consent, without anesthesia. We really need to dig deep and undo generations of structural racism in our profession. There is a long history of mistrust of medical institutions within black and brown communities that go back centuries. How do you hope an initiative like this can help improve that? It is all focused on changing us, um, who we are, how we function, how do we recruit new scientists and doctors? How do we promote them? How do we make decisions about resource allocation? There's a lot of work going on now that I think is super important around racism in medicine and what are the new interventions that we can come up with. Our thanks to Janae for that report. And switching gears here, talking about jet suits. Yes, jet suits. Could they be used by first responders to cut down those critical moments when life and death hang in the balance? One British company is testing them out. And as Maggie Ruley reports, the hope is that they may one day transform emergency care. He's a real-life Iron Man. Powered by a jet suit with more than a thousand horsepower at his fingertips and flames shooting out of his arms. Richard Browning may look like a flying superhero now, but four years ago, many said his idea was crazy. Back in 2016, I hatched this idea that wouldn't it be neat if you could get a human being to fly by just adding the minimalist amount of power, basically, and use your brain as the balance machine and your body as the flight structure. Sounds, even still, sounds mad, right? But I just did it as a passion project alongside my day job. His team made that mad idea a reality, and now he hopes this Buzz Lightyear tech will help save lives. Richard showed mountain paramedics in Northern England how to jet up the hilly terrain to get to someone fast in an emergency. In trials, the medics say an area that would normally take them nearly 30 minutes to hike to only took 90 seconds in a jet suit. With this technology, there is the possibility that we can get to someone in cardiac arrest on the top of a mountain in time to save their life with a defibrillator. Um, and that to me is just absolutely, the prospect is incredible. The company estimates that the flying paramedics will be able to carry at least 25 pounds of essential gear with them. Not even four years ago, this was a kind of crazy idea that I didn't even know was feasible. Even if it's feasible, I thought it might be a fun little gimmick to play around with, but to see it being used at least in a mock emergency situation is really magic. I mean, it's, it's very rewarding. Okay. Yeah. Richard says he can normally train people in the basics in a couple of days. And as I found out, oh, I'm lighting up. to learn, they strap you into a jet suit right away. Suited up with jet fuel on your back. <laughs> Richard tells me to trust in the machine. I feel like I'm the airplane. And my own balance. Okay, so I started off a bit rocky. Have a go with pulling that trigger in and try and play with moving the engines okay. forwards and backwards to move yourself forwards and backwards. Yeah. You've got to find that stability. But finally, I found my groove. Only jet suit in the world. They say it takes just a couple of days to learn, but it was shockingly easier than I anticipated. I made it a few inches off the ground. That was brilliant. A lot of people worry that they think there's just so much power and heat and crazy, yeah. but actually when you're in it, it's actually quite calm, yeah, isn't it? It's yeah. weirdly gentle, isn't it? It is, it is. Now Richard shows us how it's really done and proves that human flight and what it can accomplish is only a matter of innovation. Maggie Ruley, ABC News, London.
Very cool. Very impressed with Maggie blasting off like that. And when we come back, the online deals you need to know about. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored, winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor. Overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24 7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live, streaming everywhere. Right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Thank you to the doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals. To everyone keeping our supermarkets, pharmacies, gas stations running. To all the essential workers, we thank you. And with every question you have, we will be here for you every day. Because we will get through this together. Tonight, the baseball world is mourning the loss of a legend, a longtime Cincinnati Red, and then the voice of Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN, Joe Morgan, has passed away. His family announced the death today. He had battled a series of health issues over the past few years. Morgan is widely considered one of the best second basemen of all time. He was a member of the famed Big Red Machine, winning two MVP awards and two World Series with his teammates back in the 70s. The 10-time All-Star was inducted into Major League Baseball's Hall of Fame in 1990. In 2013, the Reds unveiled a statue of him at their ballpark. Today, the team tweeted a video of Morgan talking at that statue dedication about what he wanted his legacy to be. Take a listen. I've come to understand that you get into Cooperstown if you steal a lot of bases, get a lot of hits, play on great teams. You only get a statue or a sculpture if people think you should be remembered for things other than that, so I thank you. But anytime you pass my sculpture, I would hope that you would not only think of Joe Morgan, but you'll think of all the great players who helped to make that statue possible. Long live the Big Red Machine. And the message from the Reds family tonight, we are heartbroken. Joe Morgan was 77 years old. And finally tonight, the next several weeks are shaping up to be a wild ride for deal hunters with some stores starting Black Friday right now. When you combine that with Amazon Prime Day launching in just a few hours, there are lots of savings to be had. Our Becky Worley has more. Only the craziness of this year would accelerate Black Friday, starting it way earlier, like now, and moving it even further into the digital world. Amazon Prime Day is back. Amazon's Prime Day was delayed because of COVID. Normally in summer, now two days this week, Tuesday and Wednesday. It's really being viewed as that kickoff to the holiday shopping season. Consumers can expect to see anywhere from 25% off to 60% off of those Amazon devices, like the Echo Dot on Fire TVs, Kindles, Ring doorbell devices. Amazon promoting a Fire TV set for just $79. We anticipate Amazon branded home and houseware products with 30% price cuts. These are items like batteries, cables, bed sheets, and pet products. Now also think outside the brown box. Amazon digital media and subscriptions will be discounted. My favorite, Audible, 30% off. That's 12 books on tape 
for $100. But remember, this is for Prime members. And if you don't have it, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to miss out on the deals. You can try that 30-day free Prime membership. Just make sure to set that alert for yourself or cancel immediately after Prime Day if you're not planning to continue. Otherwise, it will auto-renew at the end of the 30 days. And even using the Amazon app can help you save big. There will be deals rolling out throughout the two-day shopping period. So if you have the app, you can set a deal alert and be notified when that product in which you're interested goes on sale. You can believe other stores are getting in on the action. Best Buy is starting Black Friday sales on, oh, Amazon Prime Day, October 13th and 14th, promoting a Samsung 70-inch TV for $220 off. That's lower than last year's Black Friday price. Laptops from $119 and $80 off wireless headphones. And Walmart's Big Save is already live with discounts on robotic vacuums and $30 off this Chromebook. Target's Deal Days is attempting to beat the competition by focusing on speed at their brick-and-mortar stores, counting on contactless drive-up and order pickup, and in some cases, same-day delivery to eliminate the wait. If you've always been wanting to get that robotic vacuum cleaner, now is the time. Some great tips there. Our thanks to Becky. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look at these people lining up for the massive test now underway in the Chinese city of Xingdao. The city is testing all of its 9 million citizens over the next three days after nine. That's right, nine locally transmitted cases of COVID-19 were found. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.